I'm Ewan Morrison. I'm a novelist and essayist and occasional scriptwriter. And I tend to be bothered about the way things are and how we got here. Welcome to Spokes. In this episode, I'm chatting to the Scottish novelist, screenwriter and essayist Ewan Morrison. He has written seven novels, including his latest, Nina X, which is the story of a girl who's raised in a cult and almost completely isolated from the outside world until she escapes at the age of 28. The book won the 2019 Saltire Scottish Book of the Year Award. Ewan has so many other awards and accolades that I can't even include them all here. He's a three times BAFTA nominee. I'll put all of the other information in the show notes. He has also written articles for the top UK newspapers and for international magazines, including Psychology Today. And he has a TEDx talk about utopia. The main focus in this chat is about how good intentions can have unforeseen and even negative consequences. We chat about idealism, his book Nina X about cults, love bombing and about groupthink. I began by asking him where exactly in Scotland he is at the moment. I'm out in Argyll and Butte, which is a, a very quiet, you know, it's near, it's just up from the Mull of Kintyre, made famous by Paul McCartney. Ah. And where are you? You're in Ireland somewhere, I take it. Yeah, I'm uh, up in County Wicklow in a, in a rural setting. Lovely. Of fields and lanes. Yes, we have all that as well. We have mm. um, our lanes are so bad that the suspension fell out of my car last week and I had to get a new car. So, uh, right, <laughs> pothole central. Yes, pros and cons to the countryside. It, it, yes, indeed. <laughs> I mean, I've been following you for a few years on Twitter, mm. and you post lots of really interesting things and art, and mm. you also write for Psychology Today. And a few weeks ago, you posted a link to your article, The Road to Hell. Mm -hmm. And I think I had read it before, but when I read it this time, I was like, I have to get him on the podcast. <laughs> yes, I should probably pull the article up, actually, so that I can... Um, yeah, no, The Road to Hell. Uh, that's my sort of philosophy of life, really. Um, which it sometimes takes a long time to boil these things down um, into a, a couple of thousand words, but it's been years of research, really. Uh, and trying to work out a set of paradoxes and problems that arose in my upbringing through idealistic parents, you know. Um, so I was burdened with the question of why does idealism not work um, as a child? Um, and I, it's, it's taken a long time to, to work that out through a lot of historical and philosophical reading, really. So even as a child, then, do you think that you had that idea? Well, it's simply a question of watching your idealistic parents fail and collapse um, through the, the the force of their ideals. Um, my parents were, were, were sort of hip, hip, hippie pioneers in, in the far north of Scotland, and they held the, a real mixed bag of utopian beliefs from the 1960s. Like what kind of stuff? Well, like uh, the idea that the nuclear family is oppressive, even though you have kids yourself. The idea that you can bring culture to the masses, and the masses are asleep and slumbering and they need to be uh, taught um, progressive politics. The idea that uh, an independent Scottish nation could become a utopia of planned, uh, you know, a planned society um, when, that, that when a country falls into the hands of the idealists, they will, they will turn it into a, um, a much better, more just, equitable place. Um, there was free love, I suppose, as well. Uh, drug taking, the whole rag bag of kind of um, uh, kind of dissenting activities against the powers that be. So I was bred with a bunch of phrases, which you know my parents were not far away from the SDS and the Vil and the Weather Underground and the kind of things they would talk about. 
and the kind of people who 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 would um, hang around with us. So so uh, I grew up just watching watching them fall apart and watching their ideas turn to garbage, um, and realizing that it all had a very damaging effect on me and my sister. So I mean they. They would always say, even as things were collapsing, that they they had pure ideals and that they had, you know, good intentions, and the problem was just the world. Um, but, um, it, you know, over time and through research and looking at where they came from, where hippies came from, tracing it back to Jean Jacques Rousseau and earlier, um, I worked out that this 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 internal problems in in the project of political idealism itself. I was going to actually ask you that about where did their ideas, so did they themselves read Rousseau or were there other things that they were reading at that time? Well, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? When people try to trace back the history of progressivist politics, where did it really come from? I don't think that my parents were aware of Rousseau in as much as the same way that I don't think Marx was fully aware of the indebtedness that that Engels had to the Anabaptists, you know. Um, uh, and how the entire um, progressive project rests, you know, has its birth really within Protestantism. It, it's not, it's not really understood. Well, anyway, so my, so my parents, I think uh, they they were talking uh, Huxley, E. F. Schumacher, Small is Beautiful. That was one of my dad's Bibles, um, and that was. You know, you sort of dig in as well to to Thoreau, Emerson, uh, the the American progressive tradition as well. That these were things which were floating around. I, I, I don't real. I don't think that the hippies really realised the full history of what they were taking on board as well. The, for example, the eighteenth century experiments in communality, um, the the. 210, I think, um, utopian towns built in um, the Americas in the 18th and 19th century, um, which 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 all failed, of course. But um, they were all about things like free love, communality, um, uh, you know, uh, communal care of children as well. You know, all these experiments were done um, in the 1850s. Um, was there was a huge spike of interest in these things, so it was it was fascinating to me to discover that the hippie project was kind of a repeat. It was a variation of some things which were tried by originally, um, re, you know, religious utopian um, beforehand. But I don't think that most hippies would be aware of that. It's 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 just an evolving tradition, a kind of recurrent theme of utopianism that flows throughout history. Kind of the idea that there is such a thing or a possibility of um, universal peace and that is it is it almost the idea that human beings are fundamentally good? Yes, yes, and, exactly. As Rousseau said, you know, um, we're, uh, we're born free but are everywhere in chains. I think that's, uh, maybe it's a line that runs through the population. I don't know, maybe half of the population think the people are born inherently good and half of the population think not. Um, but certainly there are periods in history where one side gets dominance over the other. Um, and we seem to be in a time just now where the idea that people are inherently good and the only thing that's wrong with them is the society around them. That seems to be very much in the ascendant. Um, and a lot of the things that come with that, um, therefore, I mean, for me, it's an immensely over, it's an immense oversimplification of what the human subject is. Um, became aware of this reading Stephen, Stephen Pinker's The Blank Slate, um, where he, you know, he says that that utopian idea that we're all born good, you know, has absolutely no, um, no foundation in science, in neuroscience, in behavioral science, in, in, in the science of the growth of, Human beings, you know, he cites some interesting examples. For example, many utopians will claim that a utopian society will get rid of lying and competitiveness. Uh, and he, he points out that lying is actually a, a, a neurological necessity in the development of children. For them, around about the age of from four to five, they, 
they have to lie in order to work out where the parameters are between me and you, the consequences of truth telling or not. It's the awareness of the social contract, if you like, um, has to, uh, it's, it's a, a stage that they have to have to go through. Competitiveness as well, you have to. It's so paradoxical competitiveness because even those who say that competitiveness is a social construct compete with each other to shout at the loudest. <laughs> yeah, it's a worrying thing. I see in my son's school, I, uh, the sports day now, mm. there's no medals for the, the, the there's no winners. Yeah. Everybody's a winner just for participating. Mm. And as this was happening, even when he was in the early years, I was thinking, mm, I'm not sure if this is a great idea. So what do kids grow up with learning? what then? Well, I mean, see, you this know. is a really interesting one. The non-competitive sports thing came, came into effect powerfully in America around about the same time as um, as President Obama's anti-bullying thing as well. And they're both based on this blank slate notion that children are born a blank slate and if you don't teach them how to be competitive, then they won't compete. And if you don't teach them how to bully, then they won't bully. Um, but the, there were some adverse effects um, of the of the anti-bullying campaign, um, which were that it didn't see a, ra um, a decline in the amount of bullying, but it saw an increase in the amount of bullying reported. So it seemed to, if you raise awareness of bullying and say you have a class full of kids and you're teaching them all about how bad bullying is, you get them to stand forward. Who's Who's been bullied in this class? One stands forward and then another one. And then they all look around to think, well, hold on, if I don't join in and say I've been bullied, then I'm going to look like a bully. So then you get these ridiculous statistics that come out of the anti-bullying campaign, which is 90% of children are bullied in, 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 in primary schools. Um, so there were also, some people claimed as well that the anti-bullying campaigns caused an increase of bullying, not just measurable bullying, but actual physical bullying because... It, uh, some of the educational material as to what bullying was was something that kids just wanted to go and try out afterwards, you know. Yeah, mm. it's kind of a natural thing mm. that children do. They're, they're antagonistic. Yeah. It's a way of making sense of the world. Mm. Not saying that we grow out of it as adults because yeah. <laughs> we're all, uh, you know. Well, there's just that, we can yeah, there's just that whole question really of, of whether or not there's such a thing as human nature. I mean, that's what Steven Pinker's blank slate was really all about was he was saying, look, the human sciences show that we're not born blank slates at all. We've got a lot of pre-wiring. And it's it's not just, you know, what we're taught um, and what our grandparents taught our parents. And it's actually stuff that's, that's here for the survival of the species. Um, and that, therefore, that limits really the scope of what we can do with human beings. We, we, we can't we can't create a perfect person. We can't create a morally perfect person. And therefore, the outward conclusion of that is that we can't create a morally perfect society either. We just have to kind of make do and do what little we can knowing that humans have got an inherent flaw. Um, so, uh, again, it's not a very popular idea, at, at, you know, at this time. It was, it was largely the Christian worldview, I have to say. You know, it's also 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 the Buddhist worldview. You know, it's it's, it's the non perfectibility yeah. of human in, beings. In the book, the blank slate, I think he talks about the idea that if we even mention the word nature at mm. all, it's considered controversial at least today. Mm. Uh, but looked down on, and people are vilified even even for mentioning the possibility that humans have have a, a, an in, something inherent that's in our genes or our biology. Mm. Well, for me, it was through years and years and years of therapy, I worked out that most of my social problems resulted from the sort of double whammy of, sorry, my, my psychological problems, resulted from the double whammy of having idealistic parents who turned a blind eye to reality and the fact that I was horrifically bullied for many years when I was a kid and had a stammer. Um, probably because I had hippie parents, actually, and didn't fit in at all. Um, so that really made me question the whole thing about whether bullying was a social construct. And when I was 
17 and went to art school, I was utterly convinced that bullying was a social construct, so much so that I, I, um, I realised that, you know, uh, I wanted to change the world, you know. I became very politically motivated when I was, you know, just coming out of my teens. Um, and I thought, well, if we can end violence, violence is the, the thing that I suffered from personally. So therefore, if we could create a better society where violence was not allowed, then that would be much better for everyone. And uh, so I was drawn into, drawn into communism. So it was a very, uh, I was a member of the um, Socialist Worker Party, Trotskyist organization. Um, so for me, there was a very direct link between the idea that, 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 that violence is a social construct and then the political ramifications of that, which are that we therefore have to change society completely to end violence. Um, of course, it was only later on, much later on, that I discovered the horrific um, legacy of violence and genocide within the communist tradition. And so, so for me, that was that was a big sort of wake up call, really. Um, so, when you say, can I just mm. ask there about uh, you said about uh, bullying being a social construct? What does that mean exactly? Well, from the progressive perspective that my parents had on bullying, um, the idea was that the only reason bullying was happening to me and my sister was because there were. Uh, uneducated, uninformed, unprogressive parents who'd raised children to to be violent, competitive and intolerant. So a bit like the progressive parent who would say that, oh, you know, um, if you raise kids to be racist, they'll be racist. And if you, you know, raise kids to be sexist, they'll be sexist. And all we have to do is change the language, as it were, so that they don't think these thoughts. Um, with bullying... It's seen that, you know, it's seen f from a traditional leftist position, bullying would be um, one of these things that's the fault of, it's the fault of capitalism in as much as it's a manifestation of the external forces in society that are competitive and it feeds down into the children who are simply just acting out class struggle upon other kids. Um, so there's... The, there's a there's a denial of the fact that 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 um, kids might enjoy bullying, thrive on bullying, be inventive with bullying, um, just as apes are. That there might be something natural in the forming of pecking orders. Uh, so, um, so my parents were spectacularly bad at not dealing with bullying because they thought it was all it was all just the fault of society and that. We could, we could, you know, they would rather do the, the long march through the institutions to, to change society than they would deal with the fact that my sister and I were being, you know, made to eat grass and pushed in rivers and stuff. Did you ever fight back? No, strangely enough. That was, that was an odd one. I thought about that. I used to have this brain, this, this brain freeze that would happen when I thought about violence because I knew that violence was inherently immoral, so... No, I just, I just kind of took it, which was, um, which was, which I would certainly not uh, encourage any kids to do. Uh, I would definitely say fight back for God's sake. <laughs> uh, I mean, the reason I talk about it, it's not so much that it's, it's such a huge and important thing in my life, although it was. It's more that it's just one of these great holes in the philosophy of the blank slate. Um, or in Rousseau's theory that we're born free but are everywhere in chains. I mean, we just can't explain why. If you were to put kids in a, in a, in a white box with no exposure to history whatsoever, with no um, um, external corrupting influ you know, influences from patriarchy and capitalism, if you were to conduct an experiment, a blank slate experiment on raising children, you think you'd be horrified to find that they would work out ways to bully each other. And therefore, the experiment would prove that there is a human nature. Right. In Nina X, mm. I'm, I, I'm making a, a box <laughs> shape with my finger because there is the idea that she is almost brought up in that white um, box environment. How, how did you come up with the idea for that? And 
Um, I came up with the idea of Nina X from there was there were a couple of news stories that that started emerging um, five six years, years ago um, about people who were now adults but had been kids who'd been brought up in in uh, Maoist uh, sorry that that's um, Mao as in Mao Zedong um, Maoist collectives in the in the eighties and nineties, and um, they were they were kind of social experiments. These these people, um, it's it's it, it goes on in a in a lot in a lot of different cults um, where you have a lot projected onto the children of the cults. So they're going to be pure in one way or another. You have it in religious cults as well. The idea is that you you do not expose the children to the corrupt outside world. Um, so there was one story in London um, about the, the, I think it was the um, Workers Institute of, I'm reading this out now, the Workers Institute of Marxist Leninist Mao Zedong Thought. Um, and um, there was a fantastic book about a Maoist cult called The O, which stood for um, the organisation where the, the leader tried to control every aspect of the member's behaviour, including on, uh, you know, who, who they would live with, who they would have babies with, how they would, when they would work, who they would work for. And they would have to write these diary reports, um, which is very much a Maoist thing. You, you have to keep a diary of your daily behaviour. You have to do a confession of all the elements of social conditioning that you're trying to shake off. So through the diary of confessions, you're trying to become the pure socialist man, as Lenin called it. You're trying to critique away the elements of culture that have influenced you. And you're trying to, to share with your comrades your project to, to, to purge yourself of all the capitalist things. So these were two um, real Maoist collectives that I'd read about that, that, that had turned into cult behavior and, 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 and had subjected young people to this kind of social experiment. And I just thought, well, this is like a, it's an extreme example of the kind of childhood I had myself. So I just wanted to, to have Nina be um, the most extreme experiment in creating a blank slate child um, within, you know, a Marxist collective that ends up cutting itself off from the rest of the world. So that was the kind of framework for Nina X and I did um, you know the paradox within the story or the driver within the narrative is that Nina after she's been kept in this increasingly isolated collective not allowed to see television not allowed to hear the radio not allowed to go outside then at the age of 28 uh, is subjected to the confusion of modern modern capitalism and um, surviving outside the collective which has collapsed and and so the book's really about whether or not she'll survive in this really rather confusing world that she's been thrown into, um, with the, the, some odd Marxist vocabulary, vocabulary and mindset that you know that she's got, she has to turn the meaning of everything around. So she's got to stop calling the police the pigs, for example, especially when she meets them in person. Uh, and part of the comedy of Nina is that she 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 tends to verbalise what she's thinking to people because she's never been told that that's not the wrong thing to do. So she'll say hello to a pig, she'll say hello pig, and then she'll go, sorry, you're not a pig. Everything's the opposite now. Greed is good. Um, capitalism is freedom. Hello, my name is Nina. Um, so it's um it's a kind of play with with the um a very horrible set of circumstances that's, that someone was put into as a child. Um, um, it's a pretty extraordinary book. I mean, I had no idea it's based so, so much on a, a real story as well. There's, um, there was a fantastic book that I came across um, by, it was called Linguistic Engineering um, by Dr. Feng Wan Yi. Um, it's published by the University of Hawaii, and it was a study of linguistic engineering in the Chinese Cultural Revolution, and explained the four different techniques by which 
uh, um, something close to brainwashing is 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 um, is achieved. Um, so there's the the uh, the the active society wide destruction of specific words. There's the forcing of new words into the vocabulary. There's there's rituals of language usage, and there's purging of people who use the wrong words. And this all went on. Wow, that's extraordinary. This all went on in 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 the Cultural Revolution, um, and it's laid out beautifully in the book. So within Nina X, I I, I tweaked the um, the insistence on language in the book. So I took a sort of political correct this to a ridiculous degree in the book so for example there's we know there's there's within marxism there's a, there's a critique of of the western ego and self and and i and me so in the book nina's not allowed to say i or me or even you for that matter um and within her diary she has to go and erase all incidents of of you know contaminated capitalist speak like talking about me and the self and I like this and I want this and I need this and so she's got to remove all these words from her diary and within the book um you actually see that on the page because the words are are are, are in, in gray rather than in black where they've been um erased um so Yeah, no, I, what I wanted to do really was to, was take all of the cultural experiments of the Cultural Revolution in China and try to stick them into one collective, one house, in the project to create, to manifest Lenin's dream of the new Soviet man, you know, the, 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 the child of the revolution who will be taught how to think and how to speak every single thing that this child says must be correct. And, and her diary is a form of auto-correction. Um, and the collective get together for struggle sessions, uh, you know, to, to try to, to um, weed out all remnants of um, corrupt capital. Sorry. To weed out all remnants of contaminated capitalist speak. So, so all, all, all selfishnesses, all clingings and longings that, are to do with the old way, um, and I, I mean it's a kind of a bizarre experiment for a child because she's she's given so little in the way of stimulus, and it's all very much to do with with um, really erasing the things that the adults in the collective feel guilty about. So within the collective, there becomes problems about who are the child's who are who are Nina's most favourite adults, given that she's not allowed to have a mother or a father, because mothers and fathers are patriarchal. So she becomes more and more attached to one of the comrades, Comrade Uma, um, in the book, who acts like a kind of mother figure to her. And then there's the kind of dramatic and the effervescent Comrade Jenny, who's always saying the wrong thing and giving out hugs, and she's like a bit of a hippie and is inappropriate. Um, and uh, so Nina has to sort of work out who her direct, who, who who's going to be mum for her, you know, um, and at the same time, the, the comrades are sort of trying to erase those needs that she has for that contact. Uh, contact, and they're they're telling her that that you know to say someone is my favorite, you know, is ideologically incorrect, or to say that I need a hug is also ideologically incorrect because it's exposing the flaws in our plan for raising you without these possessive needs. Um, and there's an amazing. Um, thing sorry i say it's amazing yeah, even though i wrote it myself An amazing thing i stumbled across which was the whole feminist debate about the body and um menstruation whether it, it comes from you whether it's 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 a uh, it's something you own it's brilliant there's a there's a section in the book where nina starts menstruating she doesn't realize whether it's whether it's it's her or whether it's private pro has she made something does she own it is it private property and it raises a huge set of contradictions within the uh, collective yeah it's it, uh, i was actually reading back over today before i was getting to chat with you 
And there's so much I actually missed the first time around that you pick up. It's such an intricate jigsaw mm, in a way. Mm. Like you've so many things that when you read back over it, you're like, oh my God, that fits in there. But she's talking about her privates mm. or as one of the comrades yeah. says, your privates. And she says, oh, it's private. But I thought everything wasn't, was public. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And then <laughs> there's a, there is a lot of humor in it. It's, it's brilliant. I, I'd be reckon it, I will be recommending it to my book club. Fantastic. Um, can we get back a little bit mm -hmm. then? And I know it connects with it to the road to hell. Yeah. Um, which uh, the, the the heading on that article actually goes on to say the rate the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, should we have good intentions? I think we should have good intentions, but something some th there's a kind of chain of problems that come when we have good intentions. One is that. Sometimes the kind of people who are drawn towards good intentions are more about parading good intentions than they are about achieving things. So those with good intentions should always be wary of, you know, the bonos of the world who, who just want to, you know, wave a flag and then they'll bugger off before they find out what's actually happened. Um, you know, Live Aid's a really good example of that. And I quote that in the essay, um, if we can get the, the actual stats from the essay in the link. Um, but but um, Livy did not achieve the, the great goals that it set out to. Um, what it ended up actually doing was, was putting billions of, sorry, millions of pounds in the hands of an Ethiopian dictator um, and helping to continue a war and exacerbate a war that was already going on and that was the cause of the famine in the first place. One of the problems with good intentions, though, is it's very easy to have two or three words, like, say, feed the world, whatever, and to get together in a euphoria of positive well-wishing en masse together in a big mob and all feel really good because um, in this godless world, if you like, it's very hard to position yourself as moral in any way. So if you've got something to rally behind, a great cause. You really get to feel good about yourself. I mean, I remember when Live Aid happened, you know, we were all weeping at home, watching our TV screens, feeling we were finally doing some good in this hostile world. Well, well, here comes stage two in the problem with idealism, though, is, is that when things don't go well, the evidence gets buried. The evidence has to be buried. So you don't see news stories about how Live Aid went wrong how funds were misallocated, how they, can, how they fed a war. We'll, we'll still have Do They Know It's Christmas playing every Christmas and we'll still feel good about it, even though the actual results were not at all what, what, um, what happened. A third thing is that the larger the scale of the good intentions, the bigger the law of unintended consequences becomes. So... Um, a really good example of the law of unintended consequences was Chairman Mao's um, idea in the Cultural Revolution. It was a project called the Four Pests Project. So he was very big on mobilising the masses into doing things together to to whip up a sense of you know collective progress and all the rest of it. So the Four Pests Project was a project to get rid of um, bugs that spread diseases and that and that decimated. Um, uh, food production. So there was, there, was, uh, there was mosquitoes that had to be got rid of because they carry malaria. There were rats because they contaminate rice. There were sparrows because the, the, the steal rice. Uh, and I can't remember what the fourth beastie was. Um, but the actual outcome of the four pests project was with the eradication of so many birds. You see this incredible footage um, from the Cultural Revolution of little children coming with wheelbarrows of dead sparrows that they've caught. They dump them into these sort of big graves and, and you know, uh, their parents turning up with long metal spikes covered with about 100 little sparrows like kebabs. The outcome of all of that was that there was nothing uh, to eat, you know, to eat the big insects when the big insects came. The locusts, the beetles, uh, the slugs, um, all of these... Um, unconsidered pests that were not part of the master plan. 
um, overcame the crops in the next year. And this con contributed, you know, to the great famine, Mao's great famine, um, which again is one of these things which was, was hidden by history. So when, a, so when a great ideological project to, to make everything better for everyone goes completely wrong and ends up killing millions of people. I mean, literally there were, there were um, 30 to 45 million people who died in the great Chinese famine. Um, I mean, of course, it was to do with other things rather than just the sparrows. It was also to do with mismanagement, with quotas, with, with enforced collectivization. But it was all part of, of the great leap forward, this ideological project to make China progress swiftly. The concealing of the failure becomes then stage two of the idealistic project. So when the good intentions collapse, you've then got, you've, you've got, history has to see the good intentions as being carried out. So you've suddenly got many enemies who know the actual data and the facts. They know where the bodies are buried, if you like. And they become a real problem. So, um, we see this again and again with the idealistic projects within history is that there's been a, a sort of purge of those who question the outcomes. That ties into the idea of cults. And I've come across this idea that when a person is in a cult, a, a fact will occur that discounts the material that they believe. Mm. And you think that that means that they will change their mind, mm. but actually the reverse happens. Mm. Is that right? You've researched a lot on cults, I yeah, think. Yeah, no, I've, I've studied, um, I studied a lot. Um, Jim Jones was a fascinating cult. Um, again, Jim Jones is one of the great idealists. If you look into, if you look into the history of Jim Jones, it's absolutely shocking. It's, it's, he began as this Marxist revolutionary who was helping Helping hundreds of of black people, basically in in uh, in um, San Francisco and um, Chicago before that, um, he was creating homes for old people. He was doing food deliveries. He was uniting them all in this uh, church that was was um, then being used for political rallies and you know, getting behind the Democratic Party. If you, there was a thing where if you ever wanted a couple of hundred people to turn up to a civil rights um, march, then you got on the phone to Jim Jones and Jim Jones was there with, you know, with his, his congregation. Um, and it, you know, Jim Jones looked like a great pioneer of, of um, progressive idealism. And for it to end um, apparently inexplicably in the jungles with the death of 989 people who, who'd taken the cyanide Kool-Aid, we don't tend to put it, thread that together, how that actually happened. How could it go from this great idealist project to this, this horrific genocide, this murdering of children? Um, and a lot of it was to do with the mechanism that you just described there. So... When Jim Jones decided to move to Guyana, um, he had this idea that just because he thought you could build a utopian community from scratch, that it would work. So it's, it's what we call the idealist fallacy. Um, it's like the intentional fallacy. You know, just because I want something to happen, it's going to be exactly like the way that I predicted it. We all mean really well, so therefore we're not going to have any trouble clearing an area of, of, of uh, tropical forest. We're not going to be completely unind you know, inundated with flood water, with malaria, with the inability of Americans to adapt to tropical climates. We're not going to have any trouble trading. We're not going to have any trouble with roads and access. I mean, they were, they were just plagued with all of these problems. Anyone who tries to create a utopia in the tropical jungles, and there have been many attempts to do so, including even the Nazis, um, they've all, they, and uh, so, sorry, not, 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 not just the Nazis, but, um, oh, who was the tyre manufacturer who tried to, was it? 
Fordlandia. There, Ford uh, tried to actually create a utopia in the jungles of the uh, tropical South America as well. Um, but these things are, are doomed to fail because because you know you're taking a Western idea of um, of the blank slate, you know, and you're meeting nature. You're meeting nature that doesn't know about the blank slate. It doesn't care about the blank slate. It doesn't. It you think you're erasing all traces of of corrupt civilization, but you're you're you know you've got swampland conditions that that are your foundation for your for your new utopia. Um, so basically, what happened with Jim Jones was people started saying, "Jim, this is not going to work," uh, and he would go, "Well, it's because you don't believe enough, so you'll you'll be punished by by everyone else." And because they were miles from anywhere, the punishments became extreme and cultish, like digging co- uh, graves for people and making them sit in them um, or lie in them for, for a whole day while people would hurl down Marxist abuse at them for how they didn't believe in the project enough. Um, there were group beatings. Um, there was um, people having their children taken away from them as punishment as well and given to other parents to take care of. Um, so basically you had unregulated, because they'd thrown away all the social mores of Western civilization, and that was part of their project to start with the blank slate, you know, um, they very soon realized that they could get away with doing anything to anyone that disagreed with them. So, so silencing of all opposition became a big part of the Jonestown. But did they, did they willingly take the, the pills then that killed them? Yes. Yes, I don't believe in the conspiracies that say the CIA came in and shot them all. Um, I, the um, the Jonestown ma- massacre. It was it was this perverse hybrid of Christian apocalypticism and Marxist millennialism or millenarianism. You know, um, there was this idea that it would be better to die, die a revolutionary martyr to the cause of progress than for their um, failed utopia to be destroyed by America. So basically Jim Jones, on the one hand, he, he clamped down on everyone in his failing utopia, in his mud quagmire in the middle of the jungle. Um, it became incredibly authoritarian, even though it was utterly dysfunctional. Um, no one could escape. No one could report back on it. And he became obsessed with the idea that the Americans were coming any minute now to come and shoot them all. So when... Um, a few of his his uh, his his comrades or disciples um, managed to get letters out to to um, Senator Ryan. It was at that time about how they want there was mistreatment and how they wanted to return to America. Uh, when Senator Ryan turned up with some um, reporters in a small airplane, um, well, we all kind of know where it went from there with the with the uh, the um, shootings, but. Um, Jim Jones was convinced after this had gone completely wrong, after the American journalists and the senator had come, um, that um, that it was only a matter of days until they were all going to be wiped out by you know American troops. So so, so they went through a process that um, Jones had been training them in for years before. You can hear the audio recordings; they are actually online. Um, now, was it White Knights or Black Knights? I can't remember what it was called, but it was, it was, he trained them in revolutionary suicide techniques. And they would go through this drill every now and again where um, um, the, the um, cyanide would be mixed, the statements would be made. So, so, so the actual time when they did it, they did, they'd been, um, They've been trained how to do this and how to accept this. And you get a horrible kind of group think that happens in these situations. I think that's what's so terrifying about cult behavior and about um, political conformism as well. Is that it, is it, There comes a point in the proceedings of, say, uh, an attempted mass suicide where it's, it's easier to go along with it and just kill yourself than it is to face the horror that you might have to oppose all these other people who've all decided that this is a good thing. And they might all be like you. They might all doubt that this is a good idea, but because it's the dominant story, everyone goes along with it. Did anybody escape? There was an amazing um, 
amazing story about an old an old woman who'd hidden under a bed while while it was going on. They had kind of bunk beds, collective spaces where they they they, they lived in kind of dorms. It was all very makeshift. So she was under this little metal bed while it all went on. Maybe she fell asleep or something, we don't know, but basically she woke up and walked out when it was over. So she she basically walked out of the room, through the corridors, saw dead mothers and babies, and then gradually out onto the, the ground of Jonestown, uh, where there were 989 people all all lying dead, um, bloating in the summer sun. I mean, extraordinarily horrific. But, I mean, for me, it's just a huge warning shot whenever we become really idealistic about things, about how the more epic your ideal and the closer it comes to blank slate social engineering, the more bloody dangerous it is. Talk to me. Talk to you. Talk to me. Um, one thing in another of your articles that you talk about uh, uh, cults, and one of the things that's used in cults is love bombing. Mm. You can see that in a lot. Like I see it on Facebook posts. Yeah. People love everybody, love everybody. I'm like. Well, <laughs> love can actually be something that's dangerous. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think love can be dangerous then in that sense? The concept of it. You mean love in the broader sense or or just love in the sense of love bombing when you join a cult? <laughs> yeah, I think both actually. <laughs> <laughs> but love bombing in a cult, but like then cults aren't necessarily always religious either, are they? No, indeed, indeed. Well, let's go with love love bombing in cults. I mean, it's a clever, it's a clever technique, and it was, it, I think, it probably peaked in the sixties. Actually, I remember there was, there was one cult called the Family. That was one of the things they were called for a while. They were, they were a kind of a hippie Christian cult. They were eventually um, broken up because of pedophilia accusations, because if you put hippies free love. And kids together, that's always going to happen. And it's happened again and again and again. If you throw away all social conventions, all care of who's the parent and all the rest of it, then you know, kids will get roped into the sexual antics of the hippie utopians, that's for sure. And there's been countless cases of, of this going on. Anyway, the family had a thing called flirty fishing, which was love bombing taken to its extreme. So basically they had these... It, you know, young girls, 16 to 20, whatever, who were converts to this Christian cult. And they would offer sex if you would come along to, to one of their group meetings. And they would offer more sex if you came along to one of their, you know, weekend seminars. And then, you know, it roped in a lot of, um, a lot of young men into the, um, into the cult. And the promise, we see what happens within most cults is, they start off with, you know, the group hug, the welcome to the alienated person who's lacking in in love or or sex. And then the 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 as you move through levels of engagement up the ladder of involvement, then the love gets shifted on to the leader. So you've got to you're you're a flawed and broken person in the eyes of the cult. So you, after being told that you're great to start with, then you're flawed and you've got to work on yourself and, you know, so you can win the love of the leader. This is just one of these processes that that is common to cults, whether they're, um, you know, like Nexium was, was like a lifestyle cult. That was the one that was in the papers last year. It's all, it all about self-improvement and, and uh, you know, uh, women in industry, you know, getting ahead as a as a powerful woman and all the rest of it. Um, although their leader was a male who insisted that they be branded with the symbol on their body, um, you get it within within these um, religious cults. You even get it within within cults like ISIS as well. I would I would I would as others like Steve Hassan, the cult specialist, characterize ISIS as a cult. 
um, you know, the the love that you are seeking is 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 the is the embrace of the virgins in the afterlife, and it's also you know the love of God. Um, so, yeah. So so cults will get you in the front door with the promise of um, a bond, a fraternity, a sorority, a sense of being with others who who are unlike everyone else. You are so lost, you poor soul, and we're just like you, and we. And we'll weep with you and hug you and tell you we love you, um, but you have to come along to you know the week long extended um, introduction course, and then then it'd be really good if you came to live with us for a month, uh, and it just goes from there really. Um, right, it's fascinating, mm. like the idea of cults and that they're that could be secular and religious totally. and yeah. Um, I think there was one thing I yeah, I, yeah go on. sorry I think actually they all come from one root though, which which is um, which is back to um, an original Christian heresy. Um, there was um, there was the uh, there was Pelagius the Pelagian heresy, the Pelagian heresy was pursued and hunted down by the Catholic Church because they realised how damn dangerous it was, and Pelagius basically said we we don't have to wait for heaven we can build heaven on earth. So that was that was the great heresy, and I think it underlies pretty much all all cults, apart from the the ones which are you know the things like the UFO cults, which believe people will be zapped up into outer space to go to heaven. But but certainly this idea of separatism and of cutting ourselves off from the world because we're going to make a, 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 a you know a paradise here for ourselves is 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 a common theme to all to all cults. Right. So be careful of idealists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Especially if they say, leave the world behind and come and join us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was two things you mentioned early on, which I wanted to ask you about. I, I don't know what one of them was. It could have been SDS. S -O -S -S. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, and, and the Weather Underground. Mm. Well, what are they? Um, so the SDS were um, Socialists for Democratic Society. Were an American organization and they were very hard left they were maoist as well they had lots of lots of maoist um beliefs maoist beliefs being different from standard um marxist beliefs and as much as maoism doesn't want to wait for history to reach the point where revolution will happen maoists believe you can just cause it right now right now and you will do it as violently as possible um or as secretly as possible, um, and that you're kind of granted um, special powers and special permissions to destroy culture um, because the end justifies the means. So when you hear people chanting phrases like, by any means necessary, it's a good old Maoist expression, really, that filtered through America. Um, it's, it, it's a rather long story, really, um, and a bit too complicated for people who want to know how we got to where we are just now but um there's a there's a direct descendants from maoism through the french intellectuals and the the the, the failure of the revolution in 1968 in france um so maoism became this sort of dominant intellectual form of rebellion and and um then migrated over into america through people like the sds and um, through Marxist intellectuals in universities who, who, who took the ideas of Maoism. Um, one, of the big, one of the big ideas that's within Maoism that we see within postmodernism really is just the idea that you change society by changing all representations. You know, so you, you control all images and you control all language. As, you know, as I was saying um, in the... In the Cultural Revolution, there were these methods to control the way people spoke. And did it work? Um, well, well, yes. <laughs> yes, it did, in as much as the Communist Party is still there in China. Yeah, that's the thing. Mm. In, in some ways, I was thinking, it's not that uh, those methods aren't effective in what they set out to yeah. do. To a certain extent, they are. Well, there's... You see, I, when I was researching the book, I had to ask myself the question, does brainwashing work? 
And I have to say that it it's only possible to say that it does with certain big qualifications. It doesn't work as a set of technical um, practices. So you can try to control people's language and the things they say and the things they see and you can control the context that they're in. But there's some wonderful part of a human being which is always sceptical and will always try to work things out for themselves. And it's the, actually it's the only hope that we've got really for human beings. There's something that resists um, the totalitarian impulse to control everything. So on that level, brainwashing doesn't work. On a societal level, however, if you're pushing these techniques of control, of control of language, of um, informers everywhere, of, of strict language codes, if you create a society where transgressors of the code are constantly punished and everyone's monitoring everyone else, as you do in a totalitarian state, whether it be um, East Germany after the Second World War, in which I believe one in three people were informers. Extraordinary. Um, or the Soviet Union, or or uh, communist China, um, then you can achieve the outward effects of brainwashing because everyone's simply too scared to be seen to say anything or think anything that doesn't um, fit the party line. Um, God, I think I can see that today <laughs> like on social media. <laughs> do you? Well, well um, yes, I do, um, and it's 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 part of a, it's part of a lineage, really. It's just. It's evolved from the same stuff. From the maybe that's also part of being human, then, is it? Um, I guess there's the there's the herding thing that we do, which is really quite scary. So um, the witch herding. So so we become herded quite easily as a species. You know, like oh, like a herd, like of a cows. herd of cows, or like a herd of sheep. Yeah, yeah. Psychologists have been looking at this. There was a study, I think it was in Bristol a couple of years ago, where they showed that. Um, you can get a hundred people to follow five pretty much anywhere. Um, if you've got people who are leading a group of, of others, others will just follow um, quite simply. There's been all these horrible tests in um, psychology that prove that we've not got as much free will or we don't exercise it as much as we think we do. So, I've seen this really um, funny and strange experiment where they have people set up in a room and when the door opens, did you see that one? When the door opens, everybody except the person who, who doesn't know what's going on stands up every time a new person comes in. And eventually the person who doesn't even know why anybody's standing up just joins them. That's that's hilarious. There's the famous elevator one. Have you heard of that one? The, the elevator one. So there was an elevator test, a bit like this, where they had six people who were placed in an elevator and one test subject who didn't realize that that was the test that they were doing. So I think it was something like every time they went down a floor, everyone in the elevator would turn and face the opposite direction, even though they're facing the wrong way. And then they would turn the other way. So they basically in the, in the, in the course of like seven floors with this movement, they, they trained the person who didn't know what was going on to do the same thing. And the person did do the same thing turned around for no particular reason at all, just because the others were and felt they felt they had to just copy or otherwise they would be stared at. Oh my God. I mean, you'd think, what are we all doing? <laughs> we're all probably doing things like that. We don't even know we're doing them. Well, I guess, I guess maybe there's some kinds of um, defense mechanisms that we traditionally had against um, group mobbing and herding instincts. Um, I guess the, again, to go back to the Christians, I'm, I'm, I struggle to, uh, for a year, I was raised an anti-Christian by my parents. And I, these days I come back to some of the possible merits of a Christian worldview. But the idea that you're only ultimately accountable to yourself and to God, and that, you know, that you're going to make mistakes because you're a fallen person is probably a better way of, it's one of the checks and balances against herd mentality. The conscience, an extraordinarily well-developed conscience, uh, might stop you from just simply copying other people.
That's it for this episode of Spokes. You'll find links to Ewan's website and some of his articles in the show description. Thanks for listening. Spokes is produced by Colette Colfer and Terry Hackett. Like and subscribe and share the video. <laughs> there is no video. <laughs> <laughs>